This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program here in America that you, the viewer, can express your concerns and tell your stories about the child welfare system and family court system. I'm Dennis Lawrence and beside me is Maria Malin. Maria, we, uh, what do we got up first for us? Today on the show we have Haley, we're going to have Haley's dad and his aunt and We'll just, we'll go to that video and show you the injustices that have taken place in this case. Welcome back and thank you again for joining us with Silent Voices. Today we're welcoming, um, once again, Matthew Marble and his aunt, Bobby Dubois, and we have Connie Regoli on the phone. Thank you for joining us again. Thank you for having thank us. You for having us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, we are talking about uh, um, Haley, who's four years old, and that's your daughter. And I just wanted to kind of go into depth a little bit more. I, I understand, and Bobby, you have, you got your foster care license um, to be able to help take care of Matthew's daughter with him. Correct. And to help him out. Now, it's my understanding that when you did get your foster license, that you did take in another child. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, we did. Um, we actually got a call, and we originally weren't going to take placements other than just Haley. Um, they called us and told us that they had a temporary placement and asked us if we would consider doing that. So my husband and I talked about it. We told them we would. So when she came to our home, they told us her background, her story, and she was actually um, in foster care, but immediately placed for adoption by her parent. Um, and so we ended up caring for her. She had some special needs when she came to us. Um, we took her to her specialist, um, did all her care she needed. We got her back to where she needed to be um, health-wise um, through therapy and stuff like that that she was required to have. And then we ended up adopting her. Okay. <clears throat> so for our viewers, they have been fighting for, for Matthew's daughter um, for f four years now, I understand. They have not been able to get her yet out of the Tennessee system, but here in Michigan, a child was placed with you successfully, and you have been able to adopt her and take care of her, and everything's went great with that. Correct, yes, and we still have our foster care license. Okay. And you know, and think about that. This is a child that was placed with them that is approximately the same age and also has special needs. And so, you know, those were, of course, the objections that Tennessee had to placing their own niece with her, in, you know, because of her young age and her special needs. And so, you know, there's absolutely, there's no logic applied at all. Right. And it's always supposed to be, under DCS, it's always supposed to be family that has the, the first rights to adopt a child rather than a stranger. That's how it's supposed to be, but as we know, they don't always follow their own, their own rules and their own laws. So That's correct. They, and in this case in particular, they just, you know, and, and parents don't know, parents and relatives don't know what the laws are. And, you know, they try to take some ac actions that just make common sense, just like, you know, Bobby and her husband, they didn't intend to be foster parents in Michigan, and, you know, to them it was like, it was common sense. Why couldn't they help Matt and parent his child? And so they tried to take some common sense actions, and, <coughs> oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. And they didn't know that there were really laws behind them to support that. Right, 
Yeah, absolutely. Can I add to that real quick? Sure. Karen? Yeah. Um, I would also like to say we had let the state of Tennessee know um, when they had told us we needed to become foster parents, we let them know we had had relative placement before mm -hmm. and we weren't required to be foster parents. Um, the, the family members still had to have supervised visits and stuff like that with the parent. Um, so we weren't new to having family placement with us right. um, because the other family placement we had, we did that for two years. And then the children were able to go back to our relative um, and continue to be raised by them. So we had explained to Tennessee, we've done this before. We're not new to it. Um, we know the requirements, you know, and we would follow all the rules. Um, yeah. And they could talk to Child Protective in Michigan to know that we followed the rules with the previous family member who we were um, assisting taking care of their kids. Right. And that only seems logical that that would be the first thing they would want to do is, you know, to to interconnect between the states with, with those who have actually licensed you and said you're wonderful parents. Um, to any anybody outside looking in it would seem the most logical thing in the world and unfortunately that's not always the way it is um, now it's you know, and I could and I can tell you a hundred stories about that Maria so anytime you want to just talk about a hundred stories like that where you know it just seems and, I, and they're new every day I have a new one every day you know so you know I want to stick to that story today because you know it's important this this storyline, you know, has, I'm sure plays out for other parents. And, you know, young parents right now, I mean, they're at the mercy of this system. They're so at the mercy of the system. So, you know, it's just, you know, it's something that people have to be educated about. They have to know where to look for resources. They have to know the right questions to ask. And they really need an, somebody to advocate just for them. And, Connie, I would just like to add to that. In a lot of cases that Dennis and I have come across that we've done for the show and even prior to that it seems pretty accurate that the majority of the parents who do actually win their case and are able to successfully retrieve their children usually have a good three hundred thousand dollars to spend on the case and that's no. really unfortunate but we've come across that so much that it's hard to ignore that fact that you know it actually takes money to buy these children and you know it's never throughout history that's never been um it's never been a fact that it takes you know good parents have to have money there's been a lot of a lot of um poor people that have been just wonderful amazing parents and that's unfortunate that that's the way our society is today well and, and here's the you know here's the gap the gap is that you know, there are no parent advocates that they can reach out to. And, you know, I really hope throughout this process, you know, one of the services that we're able to develop and, you know, and, and actually a service company that I'm working on putting together is people who are trained, you know, to be advocates for parents who are not attorneys, so they wouldn't necessarily cost as much money, but they would be specifically trained in this. Because what you've got is you've got parents who are uh, too you know, cannot really afford a private counsel like me. I mean, and I've been doing this for 22 years, and so, of course, my hourly rate as an attorney is pretty high, but, you know, I've, I went to law school, I've had bar exam, I've, you know, paid my dues. I mean, it just, by necessarily the profession demands that I have that kind of a fee associated with what I do. And then you have these people, these attorneys, who are court-appointed attorneys who you know, make no money, but they really don't care. I mean, they right. really just do it to fill in the gaps of, you know, going out there and trying to struggle and, and make a, a, a law practice on their own. And, and they're really not trained. To, they're, they're really lacking in the knowledge of, of delinquency or of a dependency law, termination law, because they're just general attorneys, you know. It's like going to a it's like going to a, um, somebody who cleans your teeth for heart surgery, you know. I mean, they're just not equipped to do it. So, you know, what we've really got to focus on is developing an advocacy service for parents, you know, whether it's in dependency or whether it's in medical field or educational field, you know, so that they stand up for these parents and their rights. But you are absolutely right. I mean, 300,000, 300, 300,000 would not surprise me. 
Right. Now, there's been a lot of violations of the law in this specific case. Um, what is the recourse that you guys are able to, to do to try to get this case back on track? And is there any? Well, you know, as I talked about on our last show, we are continuing to uh, do what we need to do legally and follow the legal process. In the interim, uh, we also filed a federal lawsuit for violations of the Americans with Disabilities Act with the ADA. In 2015, the Department of Justice finally issued an opinion letter on a case out of Massachusetts in which a young mother who had just some disabilities that she was unable to parent on her own and they took her child away from her and her mother, the, the grandmother, said let me take my daughter and her child and I'll take them into my home, I'll parent them, I'll guardian the child and you know she can continue to be a parent. And you know, the state agency said, no, you're not going to do that. We're going to terminate her parental rights and place this child in a better home. And so finally, the Department of Justice came down and said that was an ADA violation. And so we have a similar thing going on here. And they do this to parents repeatedly. They say that they're not mentally competent to take care of their child, but they really don't look at what kind of accommodations that they might <laughs> be able to make for that parent, especially, again, including relative placement. Right. And that's the, the first thing I thought about when I, you know, when I was talking um, to Bobby about this case is this, this violates um, all of the laws that are there to protect um, Americans with disabilities. It's just unbelievable that all, you know, Matthew's rights have been stomped on when he, you know, has a support group there that are willing to back him up and this is a clear violation of his rights in in this case in particular well, and, let, and let me tell you ADA is an affirmative duty of the state so basically all they have to do is be on notice that there's a disability and then they have an affirmative duty to do what's called an independent assessment and so on the very first meeting in the records with Matt, it shows on the very first meeting that they were aware he had a seizure disorder in the past. They were aware, you know, that he had had, um, that he hadn't finished high school, that he, you know, didn't have a formal education. And, and so they knew all of these things on the very first meeting. And instead of doing an assessment which said, what are your skills and what do you need to improve, they just set down a litany of tasks for him to do. And, you know, like I said on the first show, they basically expected him to go out and get a $40,000 a year job in his own place and be able to, you know, take this child in instead of saying, what are the resources that you have available to you in an independent assessment? That is the basic number one requirement and affirmative duty of any state agency when they first have knowledge of if they're getting federal money, which of course the, the Child Protective Services all get money, they have an affirmative duty to step up and take care of their responsibility. Right. Now, were any, was there anything filed through the Americans with Disabilities under that act on Matthew's behalf? Has there been anything filed in court? Well, you know, when he, um, when they first went through this process, of course, in the juvenile court, in the state court level, as, you know, and again, as I talked about before, he had a very incompetent attorney on the first, at the juvenile court level, and so that wasn't even brought up, and it was actually used against him of, here's why you can't parent your child, because you're incompetent to parent your child. It was used against him, and it wasn't until I became involved in the case that I filed some things, not only with the Department of Justice, with the Department of Health and Human Services, and people need to know that they can go on the United States government's Department of Justice website and file a civil rights ADA violation complaint, and they can also do it through the Department of Health and Human Services. And this is a really important time to do this right now because the Department of Justice does have one person dedicated to this that, of course, they're getting overwhelmed and you know, with different people following these complaints, but they have, right now, they have somebody dedicated to it. If enough people can make noise about this, we can get a class action litigation that is initiated that would in, uh, initiate consent orders on this. 
Right, yeah, absolutely. Um, and unfortunately, that's one of those things that parents usually do not find out about until it's too late, as, as in this case. And that's not, you know, when you think of this country and you think of the laws that govern this country, you would think that they're put in place to protect parents, but that's not necessarily, especially when it comes to family court and child services, that's not always what happens. That's really unfortunate. Well, Right, and, and you really have to drill down to the money. I mean, I'll know, and, uh, you know, again, I want to stick on Matt's case, but I'll just tell you real quick, there's a recent a case that came out of Tennessee, and I wasn't involved in the case, and I just read what had happened, and it just broke my heart. A girl who had some disabilities, and she actually received her own housing through the Department of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, but when she went to court, she was unable to get her child back because under her agreement under this um, apartment provision with the DIDD, it's called, you were not able to have children in that particular apartment. So here she was, she had, had gotten herself positioned and had struggled to get some resources available to her, and because they would not <coughs> allow her to have her child present there, they terminated her parental rights. They terminated her parental rights. One other thing I would like to bring up. Um, which uh, I had Matt email the, um, send the email to Connie, um, but before our, before his TPR hearing was even completed, mm -hmm. he received an email from the Department of Children's Services saying he was going to have his last visit. Now that was before the decision was even made by the judge that he was going to be TPR'd. So right there told us that the judge had already made a decision before the hearing was even finalized. Yeah. Am I correct, Connie? That's absolutely right. This, this email came through at like 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the afternoon, and they haven't even finished putting on their proof. And let me tell you what else. Not only that, but that, well, that hearing ended, this two-day hearing, two days of testimony ended at 4.30 in the afternoon and the judge had an order in his in his hand to sign that had been prepared by the department ahead of time telling him exactly what his findings were going to be and he penned that order and signed that order before the before the court closed their doors that afternoon just so that they could serve that order on me on Monday morning when we went back to try to finish our court case to try to get custody turned over to the aunt and uncle. Okay, and, and just for, for you, the viewers, um, TPR means termination of parental rights. And it seems to me the law says that all attorneys need to be present when making decisions, you know, which is why we have trials, which is why we go into court and have attorneys that represent us. Um, in order to write up the orders prior to court and when it was finished, this would have to have been done through ex parte communication, which is totally illegal in all states. Um, right. this, this decision was made without, you know, their attorney present, and this would have been done. There would have been communication outside of them being present, which is highly illegal. Um, but well, and even, and Maria, let me even pose this. This is even worse. There, let's just assume there's no ex parte communication. Let's not let's not assume they talk to each other. But what we know, what we know for sure, for absolute fact, is DCS prepared the judges' findings of what the, what they wanted the judge to find, and what they wanted the judge to conclude, and handed him an order for him to sign when the case was over. So. So even worse than ex parte communication, which assumes there's some conversation about this, I don't even think that occurred. I think the department wrote up the order the way they wanted it to look, and then they handed it to the judge to sign. Right. Yes. It, so it was signed, it's my understanding, it was signed even before the hearing was concluded. Is that accurate? That is accurate. And we did try to find out about the email. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, Connie, but we did try to find out who told her mm -hmm. that it was his basically last time he was going to see his daughter before court was even let out and before we even had a decision. Um, 
but we were ne never able to get an answer. Am I correct, Connie? That's correct. That's correct. Nobody, nobody seemed to know about it. So the decision was would have had to have been made even before they knew that all the witnesses had been heard in court. Well, I was yeah. The, the order was written up. Now I'll say he signed it. Well, we don't know when he signed it. We, you know, all we know is that before the co court closed its doors that day, he, you know, he had a signed copy filed at the clerk's office. We don't know when he signed it. You don't know when he put his signature on it. He could have put it on that morning while the case was still going on. But what we do know for sure is that when that testimony ended at 4.30, before the clerk's office closed that day, they had stamp filed a signed order from the judge terminating his parental rights and making specific pages and pages and pages of findings of fact. Which kind of negates the purpose of having a trial and having witnesses come into court, in my opinion. Um, right, exactly. That these decisions are supposed to be made after everybody's been heard and not before. Well, and when um, he seen the email and we took it right to our attorney, I mean, that was a red flag right there that they had already decided beforehand that it was his last visit. So it was just very devastating for us. You know, we traveled to Tennessee monthly on our own expenses, paid for our own hotels. I mean, we incurred all the expenses. The state didn't pay for any of it. They've transported him a couple times, but um, throughout the three years, his family assisted him in getting him there and paying for the hotel stays, taking time off work you know, um, to get Haley home. Right. Well, and just think about how the, how the less educated feels about something like this going on. You know, they feel helpless. They feel helpless. They get in this, you know, situation. I mean, had I would, had I been there, I, and I was not there that day, <laughs> but had I been there, I would have said, isn't this curious? That now we have an order signed that was signed, you know, within two minutes of the evidence being closed. <laughs> you know, they they won't speak up because they don't want to upset the system. You know, attorneys depend upon the court system for their employment and you know their livelihoods. So therefore, they don't want to they don't want to rock the boat. And and just keep in mind the impetus behind this system is money. It's money. And, you know, there is, uh, there's a great little 10-minute YouTube video by Molly Tierney out of uh, Maryland who ran their system up there. And she talks about how you, if we disrupt that system, it is going to cost people billions of dollars. And if we do early intervention and if we do family advocacy, you know, then we have a whole new deal that it's going to be a paradigm shift. And, you know, until the, it, it's just going to upset so many, upset the system. Right. Well, I, I, I really appreciate you guys being on the show today. I just want to thank you for coming in and telling your story. Matthew, I know this was really hard for you. Um, but I feel it's really important that people hear what's going on. So, Matthew, Bobby, and Connie, thank you so much for being with us today. And, you know, thank you, Connie, for fighting for this family and helping people who are in really tough situations fight for their rights thank you for well, having thank us. you thank you for being an advocate and allowing people to have a voice and the more we talk about it and the more it comes out so that they can understand this process knowledge is power and so we need to keep educating people on what is happening absolutely we'll be back after these messages if you would like to be a guest on Silent Voices, contact us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com.
Hello. I'm a child protective worker. And I want to thank each and every one of you for tuning in this week. You can catch us next week, same time, same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your, your voice, voice can, can make, make the, the difference. difference.